Okay, thank you, Elko. Uh, and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak. I'm really excited to have the chance to talk to this audience about this work that I'm involved in. So I'm sure you've all seen talks from software research uh, uh, academics that begin with uh, a little sermon about how we have absolutely no idea how to build software that actually works. And uh, there will always be a couple of slides about huge projects that run late and over budget or simply don't work at all, or about security vulnerabilities, or malicious hacking, medical devices that hurt people, rockets that blow up, and this is all true. But something else is true, and that is that if you look around, sure, there are plenty of problems, but there's an awful lot of software that actually does more or less work. We build huge, complicated systems. We distribute them across the globe. They handle vast amounts of data at lightning speed. Uh, and despite some glitches, it actually works remarkably well. And certainly the dire warnings from the 1980s or so about the impending software crisis where we were going to simply stop being able to build software altogether uh, have not come to pass. So why is that? How did we manage to escape? Uh, I think there are lots of reasons, and different people in the room might point to different ones. Uh, some people, including me and probably many of you, uh, would point to the better programming languages that are now at our disposal compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, we also have much better ways of organizing software teams, a much better understanding of the software development process. Uh, we have powerful, stable programming platforms like POSIX, Android, Apache, Windows, iOS, uh, name your favorite. Uh, and then here's the one that I'm going to focus on today. Uh, we have uh, specifications playing a much more interesting and much more varied role in the software development process uh, than uh, in previous decades. So let me take a little poll and ask you, uh, how many people here regularly use some form of specifications in your programming? Okay, quite, quite a number. Uh, maybe I'll convince you by the end that the number is actually greater. Um, anyway, my goal for the next 50 minutes or so is to tell you something about uh, what's been happening in this area and uh, maybe give some pointers to some things that, um, that you'll see happening soon. So people mean lots of things by the word specification. Uh, so I'm going to add an adjective in front uh, and then define what I mean by uh, that adjective. So what are deep specifications? Um, so I'm going to mean four things by that word. Uh, first, deep specifications are specifications that are formal. That is, they are mathematically precise. Second, deep specifications are rich. That is, they, uh, they precisely express uh, the intended behavior of some complex software system. And of course, uh, richness is a spectrum. Uh, formality is not so much a spectrum, but richness is a spectrum and, uh, and there will be less rich and more rich specifications. And I'm going to be most interested in the most rich ones. Third, uh, getting a little bit more, um, more interesting, uh, is I want to say that deep specifications are live in the sense that they are integrated with code. Uh, they are not just artifacts sitting off to the side that somebody may refer to or, uh, or use to, um, to guide the development process uh, or uh, that are a record of the development process, but they're actually integrated with the development process in the sense that every time you press the button uh, or occasionally you press a button and the specification gets uh, validated in some way, uh, against the actual code that runs, not just against some model of the code. Uh, and this is really something that, the, the fact that I'm talking about the actual running code, uh, not models, is, uh, is something that really distinguishes what I'm calling deep specifications from uh, the way that specifications have been used uh, mostly over, um, over many decades. And then I'm going to add one more thing uh, that's even a bit more unusual. Uh, I'm going to say that deep specifications should be in some way two-sided. That is, 
that should be exercised by both implementations and clients. Uh, and I'll come back in more detail to what I mean by that. So to ground all of that, uh, let me uh, illustrate by a small example. And let me also, uh, it's a big audience, but uh, if people have clarification questions or I say anything uh, that doesn't make sense, uh, please let me encourage you to jump in during the talk and not, uh, not wait all your questions till the end. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a little story about a little compiler. Uh, it's a very little compiler because I don't have too much time. Um, so here is the uh, architecture that it compiles to. Um, this is a, uh, a definition of a data type of stack machine instructions. The definition is written in my currently favorite programming language. It's called Galena, uh, and it's the internal language of the Coq proof assistant. But for present purposes, it's just a, a kind of vanilla functional programming language. So this is a data type of instructions, and there are four instructions on this machine. It's a stack machine, so it has a push instruction. Uh, and it has instructions for addition, subtraction, and multiplication. And, uh, and now a program for this machine is just a list of instructions. So for example, uh, this list of instructions uh, calculates a, uh, a nice number. We need a specification of this architecture, and here it is. So the specification is, uh, is a function that shows how programs running on this architecture behave. So the input to uh, the, this specification, or this semantics, if you will, uh, is uh, a pair of a stack, a list of numbers, and a program, a list of instructions. Uh, and uh, its output is the stack uh, that is the case after the program runs. This program, uh, this, uh, this execute function works by matching the pair of the stack and program against uh, a sequence of patterns. Uh, so if the program is empty, we return the starting stack. If the program is push, uh, and then the, uh, begins with push, and the rest of the program is P prime, then we execute P prime on the stack where N is pushed on the front. Uh, and I'll read just one more. If the, uh, if the first instruction is plus and the stack looks like m const on to n const on to some rest of the stack s prime, then we execute the rest of the program p prime on the stack whose front element is m plus n. Okay, so I think it's clear what that means. Uh, Oh, uh, if we run off the bottom and uh, none of the previous cases apply, we just skip this instruction and go on to the next. Okay, um, so, so much for the target of the compiler. Uh, what about the source of the compiler? Uh, here is a little data type of arithmetic expressions. They can be numbers or uh, plus nodes applied to two expressions, or minus nodes applied to two expressions, or times nodes, etc. Uh, and so here is a program in the source language uh, that calculates an interesting number. And now, here is the compiler. So the compiler is a recursive function. It takes an expression, it returns a list of instructions, and it compiles by matching the expression against the four possibilities. If it sees an expression of the form constant n, it compiles the program push n. If it sees an expression of the form plus and two sub-expressions, it compiles each of them, uh, concatenates those programs, and adds a plus at the end, uh, and so on. Okay, so this is the world's simplest compiler. Now, what about a specification for the compiler? There are lots of specifications for this compiler. Uh, and um, in fact, there are lots of forms of, uh, there are lo lots of ways of specifying the compiler. So uh, the worst possible way, uh, well, I guess the worst possible way is no specification at all. The worst way that is a specification uh, is some English, uh, or whatever language you like, uh, that says more or less what it does. And 
it actually says it in quite a bit of detail. So, uh, so we might call it, according to the list of criteria of deep specifications, we might call it fairly rich. Uh, but of course, it's not very formal, and it's not at all live. So what else could we do? Well, actually, we've written already a formal specification of our compiler, and it's embedded in the code itself. It's the type. So as far as it goes, uh, this specification is completely precise. It says compiling, compiling an expression must yield a list of instructions. What more do you want? Um, better yet, it's live in the sense that every time you say compile, it gets checked. So th this is great. Um, but it's not very rich. In particular, uh, it can't describe the mistake that we made in the compile function. I don't know if you spotted it yet. OK. Here is another simple formal specification. It's called unit tests. So uh, we could write down some examples of how this compiler is supposed to behave. Uh, if, we, uh, if we give it this program uh, uh, that appears first, then it produces, here I have a pointer. If, it pr if we give it this one, it produces this list of instructions. If we give it this one, it produces this list of instructions. Uh, unit tests are great. I would call them a form of specification. Uh, indeed, you could say that they kind of satisfy the criteria for being, um, uh, for being a deep specification. I'm ignoring two-sided for now. We'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, in the sense that they're certainly formal, they're live, uh, and they're pretty rich. But of course, we can do better than, than these unit tests that we've written. Even remaining in the unit test world, uh, we don't really care what instructions the compiler generates. We may care if we're, uh, if we're tweaking the compiler's performance or something like that. But to a first approximation, to talk about the correctness of the compiler, we don't really care what instructions it generates. We care what those instructions do when we execute them. So we could change our uh, we could change our unit tests so that instead of talking about what instructions come out, we talk about how those instructions evaluate. Uh, excuse me. We could talk about how the source program evaluates, uh, and then ask that the instructions match that source level semantics. So here is a source level semantics of my um, little language. Uh, I'm not going to bother going through the details. You could all write it in your sleep. Uh, but, uh, but the thing to note is that it has nothing to do with instructions or machines or anything like that. It's completely at the source level. And uh, we could now write some tests that say uh, nothing about instructions directly. They say that if we execute uh, on uh, the result of compilation, starting with the empty stack, we get a singleton stack containing the number that results from evaluating uh, this program. Okay, so this is a, a much nicer and higher level, still a unit test, but, uh, but getting close to uh, something that you might think of as a kind of point specification for, uh, for what this compiler is supposed to do. Uh, but one test doesn't seem like very, very many. We should, uh, we should write some more. Um, okay, we can write a bunch more, and, uh, and they all work. Uh, should we stop? No, uh, six still doesn't seem like very many. Let's keep writing more, uh, and uh, oh, this one doesn't work. Aha, I found the bug. So what is the bug? Well, uh, my multiply, uh, I, I had a slip of the fingers when I was writing the multiply and uh, typed E1 twice, so the compiler was just wrong. And this unit test found it. Oh, is it? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. Um, excuse me. Uh, the, uh, there was also a slip of the fingers there. Uh, um, the, 
the unit test used to be wrong in, a, um, in an even less interesting way. And, uh, and I partly fixed it. So uh, suppose that uh, that number is 3 and that number is 1. And we'll, and we'll proceed. OK. So uh, have we found all the bugs now? Uh, maybe we need some more examples. I don't know. Um, but it's kind of hard work writing all these tests by hand. Uh, oh, I have an idea. I have a computer. I could program it to write tests. This is a good idea. We'll come back to that in a second. So where are we so far? Here's our programmer. She has a specification in her mind, and she uses it to guide her in writing some code. Now, we can probably all agree that if she stops here, this is bad. So fortunately, she doesn't. She writes an informal specification. And this is better, and maybe it helps her catch uh, one or two bugs. But there are still bugs in the code. So she throws away the informal spec, of course, uh, and instead writes a bunch of unit tests. Uh, and this catches lots of bugs. Okay, so this is much better. Essentially, what's happened is that the specification has been compiled down to a bunch of specific instances. Uh, each of which can easily and automatically be compared against the code. So you could say that in some sense the unit tests themselves are a sort of specification. Uh, although arguably a somewhat clunky one. Um, so now, given this view of tests, uh, of, of specifications, uh, let me ask how many people in the audience uh, view themselves as using specifications in their daily work? Okay, a larger number, very good. Those that didn't raise your hand, you should. Um, and I want to suggest that the, the number of hands that went up uh, both times uh, represents a significant reason why we can build software better than we could 30 years ago. But we're not done. Because if the programmer goes away to take a higher paying job at some other company, and some other programmer has to take over, um, uh, he may not be very happy with just the code and the unit tests uh, because the original design is gone. All right, so the design got compiled into the unit tests uh, and, and the specification, which was probably fully blown in the, in the original programmer's mind because how else would she write the code, uh, is, uh, kind of went to the other, other company with her. So, um, okay, so let's come back to the point now that I was making a minute ago. Uh, about, uh, about improving the unit tests through the use of computers. So, so how can we do better? Uh, well, first of all, let's look at the unit tests. Um, they're a little bit clunky and repetitive. We can lighten them by observing that there's quite a bit of exact repetition, which we can extr extract out into a testing function that replaces most of the boilerplate. OK, so, so we can write a function that compiles correctly uh, that, given a particular expression, returns true if the compiler seems to do the right thing for that expression. And then we can write, rewrite the unit tests in terms of that. And this leads us to the idea that, well, if we can write four or 10 uh, tests using this and now I think we really should call it a specification. It's an executable specification of the behavior of the compiler. If we can write four or 10, then why not 100 million? Uh, and this brings us into the domain of specification-based testing. There are lots of flavors of specification-based testing, uh, uh, using random inputs, enumerating all small inputs, uh, doing concolic stuff, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll just talk about random testing, but I, I mean to include uh, all of them by implication. So what is specification-based random testing? Uh, the idea is uh, that we simply, in the present case, generate lots and lots of expressions and throw them at the compiler and see if it does the right thing. And this style of, um, uh, of specification and testing was really pioneered, at least in the PL community, by the QuickCheck uh, tool that John Hughes and Kuhn Claussen wrote for Haskell, 
uh, and which has since been ported to many, many other um, programming languages, uh, including in particular Coq. So I'm going to use a, a, a Coq uh, port of QuickCheck, which, um, which we, I'm one of the authors of it, uh, call QuickChick, of course. Um, and, uh, and to use QuickChick, you just, uh, it's a little uh, plug-in that you add to, uh, to Coq. And, uh, and you just say, here's my specification. Please throw some random inputs at it. And what comes back is a counterexample. Ah, well, there's a little bit more to random testing than, uh, than just throwing lots of inputs. Um, and you can see it from this counterexample, which is not very nice. Uh, it's way too big to look at and, uh, and debug. So uh, we need to do one more thing, which is called shrinking, uh, which uh, extracts the, um, uh, the actual failure from uh, a potentially larger randomly generated test. So, uh, so the idea is when we find a failing example, uh, we perform a greedy search where we uh, uh, kind of enumerate slightly smaller examples and see whether any of them fail. If one does, then we take it and enumerate slightly smaller examples, keep going until we get to something pretty small. Uh, and in this case, what we get to is uh, the example uh, 3 minus 0. So why is that wrong? Uh, it's wrong because, so here's our compiler. And uh, the compiler, uh, to subtract uh, E2 minus, E1 minus E2, it compiles E1, then it compiles E2, and then it does minus. Uh, but here was the semantics of the machine. So it takes its uh, first argument off the head of the stack, and then its second argument off uh, the next element of the stack, and that's the wrong way around. Okay, so, so minus was wrong. And notice that our unit tests, or at least my unit tests, did not find that, uh, whereas random testing found it easily. Okay, so I'm a big fan of random testing. Um, uh, I've seen it uh, used unbelievably effectively. Uh, at uh, quite amazingly low cost um, to improve software quality. Uh, but I want to move on and talk about what else we can do with specifications. So um, we have this executable specification. We can do many things, not just write unit tests or, or, uh, or random tests. Uh, we can use it to synthesize programs. In fact, it doesn't need to be executable to, to synthesize programs. Uh, if we have an executable one, we can build runtime monitors uh, that, uh, that validate uh, the, um, uh, the correctness of the implementation, not for all inputs, but for the inputs that the system is actually subjected to. Or another very interesting uh, uh, thing to do with the specification is we can prove that an implementation satisfies it. And uh, that's, the, that's the path that I'm going to follow. So what about that? Well, uh, I'm using Coq. I'm using Coq for a reason. Uh, and that is that Coq is not only a good environment for uh, expressing programs and, um, and uh, random testing and unit tests. It's also a good environment for proving things about programs. So I would like to prove that uh, the compiles correctly uh, function always returns true no matter what uh, expression you give it. And that proof is actually not very hard. Um, that's not too surprising. Uh, it takes a couple of little lemmas. Let me just show you uh, the proof of this lemma. This is the most interesting part. This lemma says that if I execute uh, the concatenation of two programs, so program, remember, is a list of instructions. So if I execute some instructions uh, on a stack, um, and then execute some more instructions. That's the same as executing the program formed by concatenating those lists of instructions. Okay, so here's the proof. Uh, it's pretty long and ugly, but of course this is the most basic long and ugly um, low-level version of the proof. And we can clean it up substantially using Cox uh, quite powerful facilities for automation. Um, so. Uh, so this proof is both much shorter and much more reusable. Uh, if we change our language a little bit, uh, 
This one will require lots of patching. This one may require no patching at all. Uh, and if our name is Adam Chapala, we can make it even better. Uh, so, uh, so Adam is uh, the uh, acknowledged emperor of uh, cock automation, uh, and he has a tactic called uh, crash, uh, crush, excuse me, <laughs> crash is something else. Um, uh, I think he also crashes cock from time to time. Uh, he has a tactic called crush that, uh, that will basically solve this uh, with no, um, no work at all. Just uh, a little bit of guidance. Please do induction on this, and you may need to do some case analysis on one or two things, and then we're done. Okay. So let's review. Uh, so here's our programmer, and uh, she had this specification in her mind. Uh, and a number of things that she could do to it. So, uh, so there was informal specification, there was unit tests, there was making an executable uh, version of the specification, which could then be used for random testing. Uh, and there was uh, uh, writing down a logical version of the specification, which could then be used for proof. Um, let's evaluate these. So the Informal specification was rich, but not formal or live. Unit tests, pretty rich or somewhat rich, uh, and formal and live. And then the other ones, uh, I think, satisfy our criteria for, uh, for deepness. Uh, except I do want to say one thing. Um, is there then no difference between logical specifications and executable ones? No, of course there's a difference. It didn't show up in this example because the example was simple. But, uh, but logical specifications are often able to say things that you can't say in an executable way. Um, and just to take this example a step further, uh, if we made the language concurrent, uh, then we might want to enrich our, in, in fact, a reasonable specification for a concurrent source language and concurrent target programs uh, would be that uh, any behavior of the compiled code uh, is, uh, is permitted by the specification. That is, any behavior of the compiled code corresponds to some behavior uh, of the source level semantics. Uh, and this becomes tricky or infeasible um, to, uh, to test. So logical specifications are, in many situations, uh, better and more expressive, although in a surprising number of situations, executable specifications are enough. OK, so let me come back to two-sided now. And I'll do it briefly in the interest of time. But, uh, but I want to say what I mean by it in the context of the example. So the specification that we gave for the compiler <coughs> uh, had uh, and as it were, interface or a, 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 spe a, a specification of the source level um, uh, semantics of our language on top, and a specification of the machine on which they were going to run on the bottom. And then the specification of the compile function was stated in terms of these two, uh, uh, the specification above and the specification below. Um, it has been noticed in practice that specifications like this one, like the, the specification of the eval function, uh, when not exercised from the other side, uh, tend, to, uh, tend to be incomplete or, uh, or in some ways um, uh, not good enough. And I think the one that we wrote was pretty good because, again, the, the situation is simple. I'll come back to a um, I'll come back to other situations later. But the 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 requirement that I want to impose for a specification to be fully deep or uh, as deep as you can imagine is that uh, it should be exercised. So I'm, I'm looking at the specification here of the of the source language. It should be exercised not only from the point of view of implementing it, but also from the point of view of using it. Uh, to, to, to help implement or to help prove something else. So simple example, uh, suppose we write an optimizer for our arithmetic expressions. We might then use uh, the eval specification as part of the specification of the optimize function. Uh, so 
we would say that evaluating an optimized expression is the same as about gives the same result as evaluating the original expression. Uh, and only having done something like this would I then want to say that uh, that the specification of the evaluator was uh, was a full-fledged two-sided deep specification. Okay. So so much for the the story about the compiler, uh, and. You may be wondering, uh, OK, that's a story about a 10-line program. Uh, what about real programs? So are there any actual examples of what I would call truly deep specifications uh, in the wild? And uh, what I want to tell you in the next few minutes is that, yes, there are lots. Uh, and I don't have time for a long laundry list. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, but let me show you a few. So, and and. The ones that I'm going to show you are all fairly recent, not because there aren't some examples going further back than 10 years or so, but because in the last 10 years, there's been really an incredible flowering of uh, activity in this area and amazing success stories. So let me show you some recent deep specifications. And one thing that's interesting when you start making lists, as I did for making up this talk, of, uh, of successes in this area, is that they have two rather different characters. So they fall into two piles, um, depending on what you mean by live exactly. And, uh, and one pile is specifications of uh, really quite real things. I'll show you a few. Um, where the specification has been validated against real artifacts, existing real world large scale artifacts by testing. The other pile is, uh, is situations where people have built new things with interesting specifications and verified them uh, and, and formally verified their correctness. Uh, and one might hope that eventually there would be a pile with, uh, with you know, very large scale existing real world legacy artifacts that have been formally verified. Uh, and this is really beyond the reach of, uh, of current verification technology. What's amazing is that, uh, is that specification and verification technology uh, have accumulated such large piles of these two different flavors. OK, so uh, the left-hand pile first. Uh, the, uh, there's a project called REMS um, uh, centered in the UK. Uh, that is producing a lot of specifications very uh, uh, famously of uh, lots of critical interfaces in real world systems. So, uh, so they have produced uh, specifications of the x86 instruction set of the TCP protocol suite of the POSIX interface. Uh, they've worked on um, uh, executable specifications for weak memory models. Uh, for the high-level concurrency models of C and C++, uh, recently for the ELF uh, loader format, which, uh, if you don't know this, is actually an incredibly complicated thing when you look at the details, um, and also of the, um, uh, of the memory model of um, uh, standard C. Uh, a rather different kind of... Um, deep specification uh, uh, is, for example, um, the one that's been built of the uh, Autozar uh, uh, standard by Cubic. Cubic is a company that uh, was uh, formed by some of the uh, original inventors of QuickCheck uh, to, um, to build and apply uh, uh, versions of QuickCheck to real world software. And, um, and their biggest uh, story to date is to do with the Autozar standard. So uh, this is a 3,000 page standard that describes a, a stack of protocols uh, that, um, uh, that are used to fit the software components of cars together. Uh, and uh, they have formalized basically the whole thing uh, as an Erlang quick check model uh, and used it to find many, many bugs, uh, both in the informal specification, of course, uh, and in the, uh, the software components um, uh, that were being used to build cars. OK, let me talk about the other pile, uh, the pile where, uh, where what we mean by live is 
formally verified. Uh, so maybe the biggest or, uh, or in this community most famous uh, success story in this area is the CompCert C compiler. Let me ask how many people are, uh, are already familiar with CompCert? Okay, almost mm, at least half. Uh, I, I won't go into a lot of detail. Uh, in fact, I don't have time for detail about any of this. But, um, but let me say, just briefly, uh, so CompCert is a C compiler built by Xavier Lois and, uh, and his collaborators at INRIA. Uh, it's a compiler for uh, a large subset of, uh, of C99. Uh, it targets PowerPC, ARM, and x86. Uh, it performs uh, extremely well. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it is comparable to GCC at uh, the uh, less extravagant um, optimization levels of GCC. Uh, and, uh, and it is fully verified at the, uh, at the source code level. So it's, it's programmed in Galena. Uh, the Galena program is proved correct. Uh, and then that, that Galena program is extracted uh, to an OCaml program uh, that is compiled in the usual way by the OCaml compiler. Um, it's about 50,000 lines uh, of Coq, including about 8,000 lines uh, of program, uh, which, since Coq is a, a pretty dense language, would correspond to about 40,000 lines of Java or C. So it's a, it's a pretty serious compiler. It has uh, lots and lots of passes. And the interesting thing about it is that each of the passes, or each pair of passes, is mediated by uh, a deep specification of uh, some uh, intermediate layer of, um, uh, some layer of intermediate code. Uh, and CompCert is a big success story. Um, one piece of evidence that is uh, often cited is uh, there was a, um, a kind of shootout of C compilers run by John Regeer's group at Utah, um, which tested all popular C compilers for, uh, for correctness. Uh, and, uh, and the quote is, I'll read it, uh, they say, the striking thing about our CompCert results is that the middle end bugs we found in all other compilers are absent. As of early 2011, the underdevelopment version of CompCert is the only compiler we have tested for which C. Smith cannot find wrong code errors. Excuse me. This is not for lack of trying. We have devoted about six CPU years to the task. Okay, so, uh, so they believe that, uh, that verification in this context was a very effective um, methodology for getting a compiler that works. CompCert is not the only verified compiler. Um, there are beginning to be several. Uh, so KKML is another that I'm very impressed by. Uh, the thing that's impressive about KKML is that it's bootstrapped in the sense that uh, the compiler is written in the language that it compiles and therefore uh, what you have with CompCert, namely the extraction of Galena code into OCaml and the compilation of OCaml to machine code, uh, is not a trusted part of the process. Uh, so in KML, uh, the, the, the loop is closed, as it were, and, uh, and what you need to trust uh, is only the, uh, the soundness of the logic in which it's verified and the implementation of that logic in the, um, in the verifier. Uh, another very famous um, project in this world is the, uh, the SEL4 operating system. So this is a, uh, a real-world operating system kernel uh, with, uh, again, an end-to-end -end proof of, uh, of implementation correctness. So, uh, so this is, uh, this is a, an operating system uh, that is verified down to the machine code instruction level. Uh, and <coughs> This was a fairly expensive project. This took uh, about 25 person years. So for, uh, for researchers, that's a horrifyingly large uh, amount of time. Um, but if you think about uh, the fact that this is a critical software component, we're talking about an operating system, it only needs to be done once. Uh, and uh, if you imagine the resources of a large company thrown at it, um, this is really peanuts. So this is, this is well within the bounds of, uh, of what's feasible today. Um, now I'm going to start going fast. 
another very impressive project is the ironclad project. This was also a, uh, a full stack verification project. Uh, and the thing that's most impressive about it is uh, doing uh, all of the verification that they did. Now I'm talking about the ironclad apps side of it. Uh, took them only about one person year. So, uh, so not only is 25 person years not so bad, uh, but it's improving very rapidly. Some other projects, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, flick through these. So Project Everest is a, uh, an ongoing project uh, aimed at verifying a TLS implementation. Certicos is another uh, verified hypervisor. Uh, Kami, uh, Adam's project, is verifying hardware implementations. Uh, Verdi uh, is, uh, is verifying implementations of distributed protocols. Uh, Vellum is verifying uh, uh, aspects of the LLVM intermediate language and uh, LLVM compiler passes. Uh, Certicoc uh, is uh, an ongoing project uh, aimed at verifying the Galena compiler. Uh, the Haskell core spec project is, uh, is aimed at, uh, at uh, specifying and validating the uh, GHC core language. Uh, the Princeton verified software tool chain uh, is, uh, is developing uh, verified tech, uh, tools for proofs of correctness of C programs uh, based on CompCert. Uh, and they have uh, their, their uh, poster children at the moment are verified implementations of some widely used uh, crypto algorithms. And notice that these are not pseudocode implementations. These are actual runnable high performance C implementations, uh, now verified fully, um, fully correct with respect to their um, cryptographic properties. Uh, and we're even beginning to see uh, a whole raft of verified textbooks. Okay, so why is this happening now? What's changing? Uh, I see three forces coming together uh, to exert a really powerful uh, push toward um, uh, the increased use of deep specifications and even, uh, and even mechanical verification. So one is uh, the urgent need for increased confidence in our uh, critical software systems. I think I don't need to elaborate on that to this audience. Uh, the second is that the systems that we're dealing with are, are simply much larger and more complex than they used to be. And, and that's really relevant to this community um, and uh, to me as a programming language researcher. Uh, the, the size and complexity of the artifacts that I deal with, even for the papers that I write, uh, is really beyond uh, what is feasible to reason about using paper and pencil. So, um, so we, we've, we've come to an age where uh, we just need mechanical help. Programming languages is also a really nice application area for verification methodology uh, because proofs in PL tend to be uh, large and shallow and kind of boring. Right? All of the interest is in getting the definition right uh, and then the proof is kind of routine. So, uh, so it's kind of a, a, a killer app for a lot of this technology that, uh, that has come online. And then the third point is indeed that we have a lot of new technology uh, that, is, uh, that is starting to work incredibly well and that uh, starts to make formal verification um, and specification uh, look feasible in a way that it wasn't in previous decades. So what are these enabling technologies? Well, one is simply better theory. Uh, we have decades of work on uh, things like, okay, it's mundane, but operational semantics. People are continuing to work on better ways of writing down operational semantics, reasoning about operational semantics. Uh, we have uh, domain-specific logics for reasoning about various aspects of programming languages and systems. Uh, and in particular, I would point to specification logic um, by Reynolds and O'Hearn uh, as uh, a real breakthrough in this area in terms of enabling modular reasoning about, uh, about complex systems. Uh, and then we have better tools. We have, uh, we have many mature, uh, usable proof assistants. I like Cox, some people like Isabel, or ACL2, 12, Hall Light, Hall 4, PBS. There are many. Um, 
there are mature testing tools and methodologies. so going back to the the specification specification and testing angle we have much more mature technologies for that we have effective domain specific languages for writing specifications and manipulating tools like ought and lem and redx there was a beautiful talk yesterday about testing in redx and and we're beginning to have programming language support and integration for for specifications so we have languages like daphne boogie the java modeling language f star liquid types etc etc that where the either the type system of the language is growing in the direction of a full-blown specification notation or where full-blown specifications are being transplanted into the programming language in the form of pre-post conditions or contracts or whatever and then let's face it fast hardware also helps so the the things we could do with computers thirty years ago are just order of orders of magnitude smaller and and having lots and lots of processor and memory just makes formal verification testing model checking SMT solving much much faster okay so are we headed for a world in which all software is formally specified and verified or else subjected to rigorous specification based testing no probably not but a world where pretty much all critical low-level components are verified and other components are written in much safer high-level languages is really not science fiction anymore I think in fact we're going there uh, and uh, with that in mind this is something that I'm working on personally very actively uh, along with some fine collaborators at Penn and other institutions uh, and so I want to close by just telling you a few words uh, about this um, uh, ongoing project that uh, Elko mentioned at the beginning so the goal of the deep specification project uh, is to move the community from one-off success stories to a sustainable engineering practice that works at scale and uh, I think maybe the most important lesson um, uh, from previous experience is the importance of this two-sidedness uh, aspect of deep specifications so in particular um, in the years before uh, we started this project there was a lot of activity around the CompCert C compiler there were many people uh, either uh, in the middle there developing it or uh, down here trying to uh, trying to uh, justify its assumptions or excuse me or up here uh, using it for various things so so look at these specifications they're all specifications of the semantics of C but what was discovered when people tried to take these projects and make them play together was that they had different ideas about what C is uh, you probably have different ideas about what C is from the people sitting on your left and right uh, and uh, and this is common C is hard to describe uh, in particular the memory model of C uh, is quite a tricky thing because it has its low-level aspect where you're talking about uh, bytes and layout and uh, padding and so on and it has its higher level aspects uh, where things are structured into uh, into uh, objects and uh, and those two have to play together because the C language actually depends on both uh, and C compilers use both and uh, and getting from here to here where there was a common version of uh, the specification of C that can link these things together is actually hard work in fact there's research involved in doing it um, so this fact the fact that to go from disparate point efforts on C compilers and program logics and uh, and operating systems to get from there to a world where all of these things can play together and we can have end-to-end -end proofs uh, that go from 
um, uh, the hardware level all the way up to applications is going to require some very hard work on understanding the way that specifications are engineered. Uh, and, okay, so we have uh, a number of threads that go into the DeepSpec project. Uh, uh, some of these are uh, existing projects, but the goal in the deep spec expedition is really to bind them all together into something that looks a little bit like this. <laughs> all right, so it's to, it's to make it all play together and to find out uh, what are the scientific and engineering challenges involved in doing that uh, and solve them. Um, the deep spec project is not only about uh, building stuff and finding out how to do that. It's also about education because uh, the technology of specification and thinking about specifications is not something that especially our undergraduate education does a great job with at the moment. So, uh, so this is something we'd like to change and in specifically uh, we would like to develop drop-in replacements for uh, conventional compiler and operating system courses that could be taught anywhere uh, by, uh, uh, by the people that teach it now, uh, but where the, uh, the software infrastructure behind the projects and the, uh, and the code snippets and so on that are presented in these courses is going to be built around stripped down pedagogical versions of uh, the compilers and operating systems that, we, uh, that we're developing in this project where students are not going to be expected to prove anything. Uh, the courses are already too full to expect them to do that, but they will be expected to be able to read and, and interact with formal specifications. And in particular, uh, the, the code that they see and the code that they write will be connected to the specifications of the systems uh, via random testing. And then, a third course at the graduate level, uh, uh, a little bit further out, uh, will address uh, actually proving the specifications uh, correct for, uh, uh, for concrete artifacts. Uh, with this in mind, um, the Software Foundation's textbook that uh, Ilko mentioned at the beginning that I've been working on for some years uh, is in the process of becoming a Software Foundation series. So, Software Foundations as it exists today is splitting in two. Uh, the first half or so of it uh, will now be called Logical Foundations. The second half or so will be called Programming Language Foundations. The reason for the split is so that uh, is to decrease dependencies so that we can have more volumes uh, that follow on just from the first one. Uh, in particular, uh, in early 2017, there will be uh, a volume called Verified Functional Algorithms by Andrew Appel. Uh, this one is almost done. Uh, and a little bit further out, uh, we are hoping for more. Of course, it would be a shame if all of this that we're doing were happening uh, just off in our little corner. Uh, so the third major thread of the DeepSpec project is community building. And uh, we're going to be organizing many events over the coming four years uh, to bring together researchers and practitioners that are interested in these topics. Uh, and in particular, I would call your attention to uh, the summer school that we're planning for next summer, the second half of July, uh, in Philadelphia. Um, there will be announcements circulating soon about that. Uh, we will put up information uh, on our webpage over the coming couple of weeks. Um, and uh, you can visit our website to uh, join our mailing list and uh, find out what else is going on. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and ask if there are questions.